of why she didn't just advocate for democracy, because at points she seems very impressed or very impressed with the potential of the common people. She wants the uh, wants the elites to pay attention to their needs, obviously, and we'll talk more about that today. So, you know, sometimes you wonder why some of these people don't just make that leap. Since she she knew about democracy from studying ancient history, she would have known that democracy is possible, um, and that mixed government is possible. And I'm not sure her, the answer is totally satisfying to us, partly because she seems to be wrong about Aristotle in this particular case. On page 233, she does cite Aristotle to back her point which is actually in support of the French monarchy and nobility, um, which probably is not correct, the correct interpretation of Aristotle. She says, Aristotle says in book three of the politics that the polity is of one is best. Okay, well maybe in passing, he, you know how Aristotle argues, he looks at all the opinions, you know, and says, well, some say this and some say that, but you know in the end, what he advocates is not rule by one is the best because it disallows citizenship from a lot of people and so therefore it doesn't help fulfill them uh, to fulfill their human potential as well. Okay? So he advocates the polity that he advocates is mixed government in which everybody rules and is ruled in turn. So this would appear to be a either an unintentional or intentional we don't know which, misreading of Aristotle. She says, Aristotle says that the polity of one is best, that is governance and rule by one. Rule by a few is still good, says he, but rule by the many is too large to be good because of the diversity's opinions and desires. Well, that's true. He does criticize direct democracy because the people, if you give them the entire rule, will simply use it to obtain their own class advantage. And that's why he recommends mixed government. So you have to balance the, the rich and the middle class against the poor. Um, so she doesn't pick up on that for whatever reason, either because she doesn't want to or maybe because she's misinformed about his argument. Um, and instead, she uses Aristotle as an authority to back the existing system in France of the monarchy. So she says, on our subject, I consider the people of France very happy from its foundation by the descendants of the Trojans, which was an old myth, okay, of the, that the, um, the Trojans were sort of the original civilization that, uh, that they came from. There's, you know, absolutely no evidence of that, um, but it was commonly believed to be true. It has been governed, not by foreign princes, but by its own from heir to heir, as the ancient chronicles and histories tell. This rule by noble French princes has become natural to the people, okay? And I think that that last statement uh, better represents her true reason. In other words, she uses Aristotle to back her case like almost everybody seemed to do. But what she seems to be saying here is right now, the French monarchy fits the people the best because they have become used to it. This is what they respect. This is what they have lived with. But as you move on into her work more, you do get the sense that she doesn't think this is natural for everybody and for all time, and that things can't change. Because she does entertain the potential of ordinary people. She does entertain the possibility that the nobles aren't superior just because of their birth, of their origins, um, and their family. So. <clears throat> does discuss the duties the people owe their king and the nobility and you know quotes scripture piously to support the idea that the people owe their superiors their love and loyalty and that they should bear their burdens uh, patiently including taxes and tributes so this is their duty going along with the body politic idea you know that they owe the head or the belly, um, their duties. But then she tells this story. I just wanted to see what you thought of this. 
He tells a story that could be interpreted in more than one way. You could get more than one thing out of it. And usually when authors do that, they kind of intend for that to happen unless they really clear it up for us. Um, so this is on page 234, bottom, on top of page 235. It's the story of Strato um, and the king. And she says here, in Book 18, the book of Trojus Pompeius tells us how the people of the great city rebelled so much against their lord that they wanted to kill him, his wife, and children, and all of his family. Nonetheless, there is always one person who is less evil than the rest. One of the citizens, named Strato, when he found his lord hidden in fear, did not want to kill him, but had pity on him and wanted to keep him from death. Okay, so she does depict the desire to kill the king as evil, okay, even though the king was obviously pretty bad because people wanted to rebel against him. But this Strato didn't and took pity on him, and she seems to say that with admiration. He hid him to save him, and the people believed that he had fled. And when the people had done this, they wanted to choose one of themselves to be king. But because they were divided on who it should be, they ordered that they assemble in a field the next day before sunrise. The first to see the sunrise would be their king. What do you think of that method of ruler selection? <laughs> That's my ringtone, too. <laughs> Um, what do you think? I mean, would that be a pretty good method? Why not? No, no qualifications, really. I'd not no. I mean, it would just be the luck of the draw, right? Maybe the first person to, not even to see it, but the first person to indicate they saw it. Sort of like, what's that one game? Is it Jeopardy? Where you have to bang the, you know? You might be the first to think of it, but your hand better get there really fast, right? So it would seem to be a total, you know, uh, crapshoot, basically. So this might be an indication of what she thinks of democracy. Okay. If the ancient democracies really did have a lot of lotteries for offices, for instance, the Athenian democracy, you know, you literally could have your name pulled out of a hat or what, whatever they put them into and be assigned to a jury or some, you know, office. So uh, uh, maybe it's that, okay? There's a little bit of comedy here. Um, so here's what she says about how this happened. He's, she says, his lord, who wanted to return the courtesy, that is the king, wanted to return the courtesy for the life that he had saved, advised Strato that when everyone looked to the east, Strato should look to the west towards the city. So they were all together looking toward the rising sun. When Strato, who was looking in the opposite direction, saw the rays of the sun, hit the top of a high tower, and so he showed it to the others who could not yet see it. Then everyone was much amazed and asked him who had given him the advice, and he told them how he had saved his lord and everything, which actually, that's weird, <laughs> because, you know, normally under those circumstances, as soon as a guy would say that, he'd be killed, but in this particular story, no. But So what do you think we're supposed to get out of this, that Strato kind of outwitted the system here with his lord's help? to gain the kingship, what lesson might we draw from this? Where did he get this wisdom? It, it almost seems like maybe it could be, uh, I don't know, like emphasizing also like the wisdom of the or, I don't know, or like yeah. nobility or something like that. Yeah, it, it really does. I mean, it, Basically, Strato was smart enough to be loyal to his king, and that's his virtue as a common man. And the king has the wisdom to thank him, to pay him back for his service, which is the proper relationship between the superior and the inferior, and to give him wisdom which he couldn't have gotten himself, because the king is depicted as somebody who's very observant, who's much wiser than the common man, and he knows, because he's been observing his kingdom, that the sun bounces off this tower every morning. And so he gives him this clever solution to put him into power. Um, 
So, yes, I think it does emphasize that there's a difference in her view, typically, between somebody from the noble class and from the common class in wisdom. Okay? It doesn't mean always, though, as we'll see, but, uh, but you know, this wisdom should be respected and it can be very useful. Okay? Um, in some ways, she reminds me of later conservative thinkers who point out that there's no necessary, you know, genetic difference between these two classes, but in a lot of cases, for a long time, the wealthier noble class was the, depo the depository of a lot of knowledge, and so to disregard it and the, uh, the wealth that it had in knowledge was to kind of hurt your society. Okay. So, uh, she concludes by saying, after a long time, after t a long time after, in the time when Alexander the Great reigned, the treason of this people to its lord was spoken of, and Alexander wanted to avenge the king and went to assail the city and take it by force and punish them severely. Because the king that he had saved was dead, though Alexander confirmed Strato in his kingdom and ordered that his children should reign after him because of the kindness he had done his lord. So Strato is greatly uh, rewarded for his loyalty and obedience and so forth. And, so, and what we see there is a common man, so to speak, actually able to govern a kingdom. Okay? Now he's given it in a way by a noble. He's given the wisdom he needs by another. But yet he continues to reign. And so that kind of puts a twist on what would otherwise be just a story of loyalty and obedience and so forth. And it makes you just wonder a little bit, does, does Christine believe in the inherent, inherent superiority of the nobles? Okay. Maybe not, if somebody like Strato could rule and continue to rule and be recognized by somebody like Alexander as capable of ruling. Okay. So that's a little bit surprising. Um, so in, in general, Christine's message seems to have two different sides. On the one hand, it's very smart and uh, good for the most part, although not always, for people to obey those who are put above them and to recognize the wisdom that they have. And it's very good for those above to take care of the people. Okay? But that doesn't seem to mean that smart people, wise people can't come from the lower classes. It's just more rare. So that means that perhaps she doesn't think there's any inherent superiority in the upper classes. But their superiority is due to things that, that they have. You know, Their wealth leads to better education, more leisure to learn, to think, to contemplate. Okay? And uh, so this isn't something inherent in them. Okay. Well, that's a sort of proto-democratic idea, if that's the case, because as we move along, we find more and more people pointing out that the only difference between the elites and the common people is not anything inherent, but opportunity. Okay? Um, the nobles, the elites, they have more opportunity to gain uh, education, to gain wisdom, because of their position. Okay? And this is why there's this gap between the two. But they would argue, if the common people were allowed an education, if they were allowed enough leisure to be able to learn, they could rise up and they could be the equals, or even the superiors of the uh. okay. So we see just a little inkling of that here. So we see Strato going from his common origins to, the, to great leadership due to his character, due to his ability to learn. Okay. And what we find from Christine is that she values wisdom highest of all the qualities of character that a person can have, and that it comes not from just who you are or what family you come from, but it comes from work, okay, from study. And this shouldn't really surprise us when we reflect on the fact that she herself was in this category. The daughter of an astrologer is not really a very high status in society, you know, better than a common laborer, definitely, but certainly not the highest of status. Um, and yet here she is able to write books that are patronized by the elites. She's at least taken seriously by some of them. She's able to make arguments, okay? And she's a woman, 
on top of that. So, you know, this is a, this is got to be, it's got to have occurred to her that if she can do something like this, that other people who are not in the highest positions of society can do something like it too. Uh, she also points out, only in passing in what you have, that a lot of priests of lowly origins have this too. They do have, they don't come from, you know, blue blood families, but they have the education and the time to gain wisdom. Okay. And so she doesn't deal with them in a lot of detail, but she sort of equates them to the intelligentsia. You know, these are the, these are, some of these people are the philosophers of her day. So, as I've said, if the nobles have more than others, it's simply due to the access they have, uh, not to do some special quality. All right, so, having said that, a lot of the rest of what you have deals with the so-called third estate. It, uh, this book covers all three, um, but you have the name of the third. The three estates that she, as she divides them up, are the prince and the top nobility, soldiers and administrative officers, and the people. Okay? So most of what you have deals with the people. And then she divides the people into three more estates. The clerics, the first estate of the people, the burghers and merchants, and we'll talk about who they were. And the artisans and agricultural workers, third. And these are ranks. In other words, she's ranking them according to their relative social importance. Although, in the way that she speaks of them, they almost become equal in importance. But as far as the way that people at this time were classified them, Clerics would have had to have come first because they're men. And burghers and merchants are more important than these people who are basically, you know, common laborers. Okay? So as far as clerics go, it's kind of interesting what she does with them. Because she doesn't discuss in the chapter on them, she doesn't discuss them very much at all, but goes into a discussion of ancient philosophers. And I gather that this is because clerics fill the same sort of role in her view. Okay. Um, and they are people who, because of their hard work, gain wisdom, if they do. You know, they do it because they have the ability, due to the access they have as priests, brothers and so forth and nuns. But, but if they gain wisdom, it's due to their hard work through their study and so forth. So she discusses Cleontes, a philosopher who uh, supposedly worked all night so that he could study all day. Don't even think about sleep. <laughs> Maybe he slept a couple of hours in between. Plato, of course, who came not from a you know, family of high status. Well, sort of somewhat high status, but obtained his knowledge through hard work. And Democritus, who's famous for basically choosing a life of poverty um, in order to have that access to wisdom. Choosing not to work, in effect, um, and to avoid uh, that type of work that makes money so that he could work uh, simply on gaining wisdom. So none of these people she treats as classified as some sort of elite, you know. Um, so I suspect that she's saying, you know, the clerical class, the religious class, is a class of people in medieval society that are not of the elite, but they can gain wisdom too, and in some ways they're the brain trust of her society, okay, alongside some of the intellectuals from the elite class. I'm sure people could make more of this. I mean, another interpretation would be that she doesn't really care about the clerics and wants to discuss philosophers instead. So there's more than one way to look at what she says. Um, and you're free to interpret that however you want, because that's a bit mysterious there. Um, 
then she discusses the second estate. Now this is, um, in the way that she describes it, I think what she's trying to get at is what, I'm more, far more familiar with the term, the gentry. The gentry class was a class of people that had money that tended to come from older families, but weren't of the, they weren't of the no, nobility, okay? So they were kind of like second class, rich, okay? But they were not merchants. And actually, as time went on in Europe, these people, they tried to gain, regain their connection with the noble class by doing things like buying coats of arms or rediscovering their family's coats of arms and trying to reattach themselves to their, um, their noble origins. Uh, but she describes them as people who tend to live in the cities instead of in the countryside. They're wealthy, they have inherited wealth, but they're not of the noble class, okay? Uh, or only, you know, kind of far removed from uh, the top uh, rungs of society, okay? And because they have inherited wealth and are not merchants, they play a special role, okay, in sort of being a mediator uh, in society. Okay. It's kind of nice to not have to work for a living. Um, <laughs> can you see how that might detach you a little bit from, uh, you know, just pure self-interest and allow you to think about the common good more generally? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You know, we tend to think of, well, Aristotle said the middle class was that mediator because you know it actually did make the money and enough money to sort of tie it to the interests of the society as a whole. This class does not work for its money. Okay, it has money, and uh, but it still fills this role, and it does so because of the detachment that it has. You know, it's able to have some freedom to be able to uh, fill this role. So she says of them that they should exude integrity and they should not be ostentatious, which I think is a slam against them because uh, you, get, you, you get the sense that she thinks a lot of them live too ostentatiously. They tend to, unlike the very top class, they tend to you know, be kind of obnoxious with their money. Okay. Um, so in other words, she's saying, please rein this in. And, um, says of them that they could fill, it should fill this mediator, mediator role between the common people and the prince. Okay. So common people, she says, are ignorant in meaning that they are not knowledgeable enough as the burghers are and they should not meddle in what they cannot understand and this is why they need this class of people. Um, the burghers need to be aware that if the common people's interests are not met, that they may have political trouble. And this is not in anybody's interest. Okay. And so the burghers can be this, this group that speaks upon, on their behalf to the nobles, to the prince. And the way that she depicts this as more or less they can be supplicants for the people, by which I mean that they should not go to the king or to you know, the, the noble and say, look, you're abusing these people, you're wrong, you know, you're unjust, etc., because this will anger them. But rather they need to be very diplomatic about it. Okay? They need to be respectful. And by doing that, hopefully, be welcome in this role. So they shouldn't complain about the monarch's policies. She's trying to avoid any sort of rebellious spirit here. She's not somebody who wants rebellion. Rather, she wants things to work smoothly, and she's hoping that if people understand what's in their true self-interest, they will, they will comply. They also should not quest for their own power just because they're wealthy. They need to keep in their place, in other words, and fulfill their role, but not try to step outside of it. These are people who might have enough education and certainly have 
a point of view that allows them to see why it's best to operate in this way, to take, to pay attention to the needs of the people, but also not to offend the elites. Okay. So it's interesting that these people could be the linchpin on which the piece of society, you know, pivots basically. Okay. So if that's the case, they really are very important, or could be. And they could uh, start a rebellion. They could start political trouble, okay? especially if they're aware of the type of influence they have. So she's asking of them to be very responsible with this. And you would think that she would see the next group as even more important, but she doesn't. And maybe that's just because times hadn't quite changed enough to allow her to do that. Okay? Because she separates out this different group. They're, they're both in the second estate, but they're very different. Okay? You've got the gentry or the burghers on the one hand who don't have to work for a living. And then you have this merchant class on the other hand who can be just as rich, if not richer. As time went by in Europe, these people got way richer than the gentry and even the nobility. And as we were transitioning into a different type of economy, uh, some of the older nobles and gentry actually fell into poverty because their way of life was being usurped by these merchants and this new way of making money. Okay? Um, but at Christine's time, this probably was not apparent yet, just how they would come to basically take over um, from the uh, nobles. It would, it would change everything. It would change the economy. It would change the political system as people who made money for themselves, you know, gained the upper hand. But uh, the way that she addresses them is they fulfill a different role, not a political role like the burghers, but they should also understand their place, and their place is to make money. The more that they do their job well, whatever it is, making things and selling them, uh, trading, importing and exporting and so forth, the better off the economy of the whole country will be, the better off the, the common people will be because they will have jobs, the cheaper the goods will be, which also benefits the common people. Okay. So she sees that they have a power, but it's purely economic power. She doesn't see yet that the political power. Okay? Um, and she's saying to them, uh, you do not fill that political role, but rather you need to do your job well of making money, and also you need to remember your Christian responsibilities to charity. Okay? You have a responsibility to take care of the poor, but not politically, but, but through your good works. Um, the same obligation anybody with money has to um, well, she says to tithe, actually, uh, which is, I think it's always been 10%. Okay. Um, and they could be responsible for great things like chapels and hospitals and schools and so forth. And there is a, a, you know, an attraction to, to supplying these things, both to help society and also to elevate one's status. This is a way of, of elevating one's status in the community and to gaining some credibility. At this time, people owe, uh, on top of the merchants kind of look down on them, okay? They, you know, the, the aristocrats and even the gentry, they look down on this. You have to work for a living, okay? It reminds me of a scene from Downton Abbey when one of the guys, he comes into the family, he's a, he's a lawyer, and he's talking about, you know, on the weekend, I'll do this, and one of the members of the family says, what is a weekend? <laughs> and they're very put off by the fact that this man has a job and wants to continue to do it even though he's in the family. So I think that uh, one way that these merchants could gain some status and credibility and not be looked out upon quite so much was through their charitable giving, through fulfilling that function of taking care of others, which put them in a similar role to uh, their superiors. Okay. Now, the first time I heard that, what is a weekend? I thought, really? There were people who didn't think in terms of week and weekend? Well, if you never have to work, that's 
that's true. You know, what is the week even for? You, you, <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. Um, all right, so we have them and we know what their role is. And then finally, down at the bottom, we have uh, the third part of the third estate, the artisans and the agricultural workers. Um, you know, they were considered to be the least important people in society. Okay. And by putting them third, Christine <coughs> confirms that in a way. She confirms the way most people view them. And she doesn't have all nice things to say about them herself. But she does spend quite a bit of time discussing their virtues, which elevates them a bit. Okay. Um, first of all, you know, we know already through the body politic imagery that these are essential people and that they need to be recognized as such because they do the work that sustains society. Okay. And furthermore, the work that she does, that they do, are, is not ignoble. In other words, you know, most people would have said, well, you know, they do what they do because they can't do anything else because, you know, the, low, the lowest part of society has to do manual labor, okay, because they don't have any other assets at their disposal, okay? and they're there because that's best suited to their nature. Well, rather than directly protesting this, she elevates what they do by discussing its, its closeness or relation to science, an interesting tactic. Now when you think about it, it's really true that the people who work with their hands have the most immediate experience of and knowledge of science, although it's not in a systematic study of it, right? But who knows about geometry other than the intellectual who reads of Euclid or whatever in his library? Uh, but the builder, who may not even understand the ge geometrical principles he's putting into place, but he's using them every day. Okay. They might not be able to write out a formula or whatever, but he's going to be or a theorem, but he's going to be able to apply them. Uh, my my grandfather, who I never met, was a roofer, and he had something like a third or fourth grade education. Uh, and my dad worked with him in roofing until he went off to uh, World War One or World War Two, excuse me, and then the Korean War. And then with the GI Bill, he got an education. Uh, but uh, he said that his dad knew geometry better than a lot of people with a high school diploma because he had to apply it every day. And he probably couldn't even say exactly what he was doing, uh, but he did it very well. Very, he was well known. Actually, if you go down to, they did these roofs in Lexington, Kentucky. Some of these metal roofs, they made copper roofs, for instance are still on buildings today, still working well down there. So he knew geometry because he had to, because he learned it as he gained his skills. Um, somebody who's in farming may not even know what genetics is, and, and back then genetics wasn't on the radar screen, and yet through working with plants every year, they would have basically been working with genetics or animal breeding. Okay. People knew about animal breeding long before they knew how it worked, you know. And through working with them, breeding the best of animals with the best, they produced a superior stock, right? So what she's saying is these people actually have a lot more knowledge than we want to give them credit for. It's gained in a different way, but they, they work very closely with nature. They know how it works. They've had to, to be successful, make observations. They've had to you know, change their way of doing things over time to make it better. Um, and so they have a, a type of intelligence, okay? Um, so this elevates their status. I mean, if she can say they have a sort of wisdom after all, they actually have some knowledge of science, though it's not from books, okay? Then they are not the sort of animalistic you know, life forms that some of the elites wanted them to, wanted to make them out to be. On the other hand, too bad, she has some bad things to say about them. 
What's the chief fault in, in her view, do you think, of, um, of the uh, working class people? No. What's, what's their vice? Well, she's a little bit of a moralist. I mean, I'm sure you've noticed that, okay? Um, and she wants everybody to live a virtuous life. She wants people to, to live, life, live lives in accordance with Christian virtue, right? And so she, while she elevates the common people because they do have some knowledge, practical knowledge, okay? Um, they also have some vices um, that she thinks are peculiar to them, but I, I doubt it. Uh, she says on the top of 244, but to speak a little of the fact of their habits, I would to God they pleased God in themselves, because it would be pleasing to God if their lives were more sober and less licentious, as is appropriate to their estate. For lechery in taverns and luxuries they use in Paris can lead to many evil and unsuitable things. Aristotle speaks of the voluptuous life that such people and those like them lead, saying that many seem like beasts because they choose lechery before any other pleasures. Well, that's a little bit delicate, isn't it? <laughs> Does anybody know what she's talking about? <laughs> Excessive drinking and pouring around and uh, generally partying and wasting all of their money and time that they have. So. Um, I think, and this is a little bit of a stereotype on her part, you know, that she sort of sees them as this is what they do in their spare time, okay? But actually, if you think about it, I'm sure there had to be members of the noble class who basically committed the same sort of offenses, maybe in a different way, and maybe not as visibly, okay? But you can't tell me there weren't a lot of people drinking too much and having licentious sex with people they weren't married to amongst the noble class. So this is kind of a, a, a stereotype that she's bringing up here. And uh, they eat too much, they drink too much, you know, when they have any money they blow it. Some of you may remember St. Thomas More in Utopia saying the same thing about the lower classes. Okay? It's kind of a typical thing for people to say if they were trying to find fault with that. So they, they blow what little money they have, and you know, as soon as they get any money, it's down to the tavern. Sure, there were people like that, but it's not like those vices were unique to uh, to the common class. All right, so she does temper. Maybe there's a rhetorical reason for this. You know, she she doesn't want the uh, the people to think that she's elevating the uh, common class out of all proportion. So perhaps she acknowledges the stereotypical vice in order to look more reasonable, or because she actually believes this and wishes they could change. Okay. Again, she elevates them by associating them with some very important people, two from the Bible and one from Roman history. Okay. Um, Adam, of course, the first farmer, as well as the first everything else, right? But uh, he was the first to cultivate the land and to um, breed the animals and so forth. And Noah, uh, also another just common man who after the flood planted vineyards and was a farmer. And then he mentions Diocletian. She mentions Diocletian, an emperor of Rome, who actually went back to his estate to farm after being emperor, which was a, an ideal of Roman leadership, sort of the citizen statesman who did not long for perpetual fame and power, but would return to his farm or his you know, private life after having ruled. Okay, Cincinnatus would be another example of that ideal. All right, so this is how she leaves us with this impression of the common laborers. And so, I mean, the overall message seems to be, you know, all of the parts of society have their special roles and their special virtues and there needs to be more respect among them. And these lower classes of people who, we, who the elites generally downgrade or disregard should be considered very important. And one, the burghers fulfills a political role even in a, an aristocratic uh, form of government, even in a monarchy. 
so she doesn't call for the people to fulfill any sort of uh, political role, but there is this threat of rebellion. And while she does not wish them to ever rebel, it's there, and this is why you need this mediator, this is why you need the elites to pay attention to the needs of the common people, because there's always that concern. All right, so, so ends Christine. <laughs>